sharing as well. A lot of it, I feel like, goes into what we were discussing, you know, this whole this whole time, being being organized, making sure everything's accounted for, and trying to answer these questions as early into the process as possible. Um, okay, let's see. So I'm going to move on to the next little topic here. Um, hey, font font is the next thing we want to discuss. So this is a little bit of an easier issue because now there are so many things that let's see. I mean, that could be like you have their background images, anything like that, title page images, covers. Um, so, so thank you for that. That was very good. Let's see, next image, uh, next thing is fonts. And thankfully, there are there are definitely ways to get in trouble by using fonts. If you don't have proper license for them, if you maybe have another project that you've got and you like the font that somebody used and you put it in your project, that could be an issue. Um, so what I always say is that there are two very good resources to get fonts that you know are licensed properly and that you can use for commercial or non-commercial and they are um, Google Fonts and Typekit. So Google Fonts is just this repository of open licensed fonts, basically open source fonts. So um, it's pretty wide. Um, there's a lot of really good fonts in the in that section that we used to use a lot. Um, that, you know, really kind of clean things like Roboto or anything like that. And then Typekit is licensed through um, Adobe's Creative Cloud. So it's almost like an online repository of fonts that you can sync. They help you sort of avoid issues, I think. I know some people don't like this aspect of it, especially even people that work here, um, is that you can't download the file. And that is because they, um, so you can't, you can't, because you can't download the files, I think it's helpful because there's no licensing issue. Everything is just through InDesign, essentially. You can log on to your profile, same thing that you would have used to download your software. And then you have the option to go to typekit.com, sign in, select a bunch of different fonts. You can sort of um, reduce the selection by saying, well, I just want to look at serif fonts or sans serif fonts or handwriting. And then you just use to sync that font. And then it's available to you when you go back to InDesign to use. So you can treat it like a normal font file, um, but you don't have to worry about any of those issues. And again, the only thing um, to worry about with fonts is going to be the aspect of, you know, how many glyphs are available to it. And that goes back to what we were talking about before with looking at the special characters in that hub stats list, and then making sure that you use something that is um, appropriate for it. So we had a type, uh, we had a book that needed a lot of Balinese fonts, so like a Balinese numeral. I think Elvis, was that your project? No, that wasn't yours. So. Um, and so we needed to track down typeface that actually had Balinese numerals in it because we didn't want to place them as arch or anything like that. And thankfully, that's where that Google Fonts come in handy because they're so universal. They they have this really really wide variety of characters and glyphs in the in the built into the font files because they're basically you know, universal and used everywhere. So I would just keep that in mind. A lot of that's going to be handled by your by your designer or by your typesetter if you're not doing it in-house. So I would just maybe keep that in mind if you are gonna do anything in-house, but otherwise just ask the question because what you don't wanna do is get some sort of cease and desist from you know, ITC or somebody like that, some big font house to say, hey, we identified this and we wanna make sure that you have a license to it. Then you have to go back to your designer and say, please tell me that you have the license for this font. If they do have those licenses, great. Otherwise, and then you have these two big resources that, from which you can pull up a lot of different things. Yeah. You know, you don't have any question whatsoever because you know that it's available and licensed for any use for any person, any number of uses. So my, my personal opinion is just to like remove the issue. Yeah, Carla, that's a very good point. Yeah, it's just about readability. And I mentioned handwriting fonts because it's available, but I can't imagine it's going to come up too often in a lot of these textbooks because we're really concerned about utilitarian issues when it comes to this. Um, you know, Jester MT, I don't expect to pop up in a lot of things. Um, no comic fans, anything like that. <laughs> um, so, so that's basically it about fonts. The thing I just wanted to raise was the issue of, um, of licensing and to point you to those two good resources. Um, I mean, the other thing is that with Google and Typekit, you can also use them on the web as well. 
Okay, sure, I can explain that. Yeah, Richard's asking about explaining between text and display fonts. We'll see if this is one of those cases where I'm using a term differently than other people. So feel free to chime in after I have this discussion. But when I refer to text and display fonts, those are the two big families here, and we can see them in action you know, right here. So this is my text font, the text that I'm using for the body of the book, the text I'm using for the main text. Um, and this would be my display font, the one that I'm using for chapter heads, titles, uh, it could be used for things like, at least in this system, I'm using it to differentiate between, let me jump to that page. We're using it to differentiate between things like sidebars and boxes and the main flow of text. So the student or the reader knows that this is all part of one thing and this is something else. It could be a box, it could be you know review questions. I think we did the same thing with the review questions as well. Right. So it's again, it's this, function of separating things out for the, for the user so that they know as they're reading, they're kind of looking for these shapes and this is the main content of the book. Anything else is our, our way of keying that, you know, change your mindset because now we're talking about another thing. How'd I do? Good, awesome. Um, let's see, and then let's see, the last thing I wanna talk about, and I'll stop sharing again, is, um our printing um and that's the method of printing so we talked briefly about pod printing and a lot of that is about what's called digital printing and the other option there is offset printing i am not going to talk too much about it because my guess is that we're going to be doing a lot of pod printing and the big differences there are um digital printing is about Think about like your printers at your home or something like that, or like spraying ink onto pages as opposed to offset printing, where it's more traditional. We have a plate, that plate is then covered in ink, and then the flavor is rolled onto it, and that's where the ink transfer happens. So advantages and disadvantages there, POD printing can do almost any number of pages. We don't get into signatures a lot with digital printing. It can just be like an even number of pages as opposed to the total needs to be divisible by 16 or eight. Um, digital printing is also relatively fast. Uh, it's totally adaptable. You can just give somebody a new you know, PDF and they can just run that through their system and print it on the paper and chop it, make a book. Uh, and then it's also um, you know, fast and a little cheaper as well. Uh, you can also do smaller units as well. If you just wanted to print 50 or you just wanted to print 30 for your, uh, for your class, then you have the option to do that. Offset printing, going to be cheaper in larger amounts. So if you're getting 5,000 of your book, it's going to be cheaper to do that through offset printing, but you kind of need that threshold of numbers to go up. The other advantage to offset printing is that because of these plates, you get a lot smoother, crisper, nicer printing quality. Sometimes digital can be um, streaky a little bit. You get this little kind of Xerox effect to it. It doesn't always look as clean as offset printing. So offset's gonna be a lot higher quality, but you're definitely gonna pay for that quality and have a lot more of those. And you get into the issue of, you know, the, how these are gonna be bound. So you might get into the idea of signatures and things like that with offset printing. So um, I only bring that up because figuring out that ahead of time may answer a lot of questions you have in the design. Like, is there a signature? Well, I'm printing offset, so yes, there's gonna be a signature. Do I want to have big full color pages? Uh, we have a client that doesn't like to do that because they do POD printing a lot. And their head designer dislikes the look of that sort of streaky you know, inkjet feel to them. If they were printing offset then, sure, absolutely. Nice big solid colors. Um, so that could sort of affect how you're gonna to talk to your designer. Your designer may ask that question. Yeah, 50,000, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're, as Richard mentioned, if you're printing 50,000 of your book, then it probably makes a lot of sense to do offset printing and you get a really gorgeous project at the end of it. Um, I don't know how many people are thinking for print runs, but again, if it's just maybe a smaller, sort of like your teacher wants to write a book for their class, then POD printing probably makes a lot more sense. Uh, POD slash digital printing. And that goes through that company I mentioned earlier, um, Lightning Source, although Scribe also has a couple different contexts at different printers who I believe do both depending on which one they want to go with. 
All right, so let's see. That's pretty much it. So, do anyone have any questions about printing methods or um, images or fonts? Any other any other basic design questions as well? I'm trying to keep sort of like a general overview in that terms because again, you may have in-house people or freelancers that you deal with. So I don't want to necessarily assume to say, always make your display font stand serif or, or anything like that because that's much more up to you guys. 